Thanks very much. It's, it's, it's great to see you all here. It's great to see some, some friendly faces, well, I hope friendly faces in the audience anyway, who I recognise around the village. Um, so, I'm going to talk today about soil carbon, the main part of the journey to net zero. Perhaps that's something I'll convince you about during the, during the talk. We'll, we'll see. So let's uh, start. Um, so I guess the, the, the talk this afternoon will be split into a number of sections. So I'm going to start by quickly um, outlining why we should be interested in, in soil carbon. I'm going to give you a few definitions. I apologise for this. There will be a, you know, some, a little bit of technical language is going to creep in. So uh, we'll have a few definitions. We'll then talk a bit about how carbon behaves in the soil uh, and then we'll start to think a bit more practically about what we might be able to do to increase soil carbon and then I'll kind of finish up by thinking about some of the soils uh, around this area and what they might offer in terms of, uh, of storing carbon, particularly which of the soils in the A, O and B will be in our top three uh, will be our top three carbon stores, so we'll come on to that right at the, right at the end of the, of the talk. So let's start by thinking about why we should be interested in soil carbon and why there's interest all around the world at the moment in, in soil carbon. It's, I suppose when I started my career back in the 90s, it, soils were quite a hard sell to people. Trying to get people interested in soil was was really quite quite difficult. And I suppose in the last 10 years, particularly as we've been become interested in, in carbon and how we sequester more carbon in the environment, soils have kind of come right up the agenda, so now they're at the forefront of the political agenda. If any of you have seen the, the recent government document, the, the, um, the, the update of the environment plan, soils are very prominent in that document. The EU has just produced a soil strategy, which will, which, will become a, uh, which will become EU law in the near future. So soils are, are, are kind of a hot topic at the moment, which is great for people like me. It's a shame of the end of my career and not the beginning of it, but there you go. Um, but the reason that, that we're in, one of the reasons we're interested in soils is, is because they store a lot of carbon. And if you, you, you know, just schematically, Soils store more carbon than all the vegetation and the, all the carbon in the atmosphere combined. So in terms of the kind of the terrestrial ecosystem, they are by far and away the biggest store. And because they're a big store, it makes them interesting when we come to think about how we might sequester uh, more, more carbon. Okay, so can you see what happens? Good. So we're just going to have a few definitions now. Um, so the first one is about what, what is soil carbon. Well, carbon. When we talk about carbon, we're talking about the element. The element comes. Somebody said to me earlier, is it mineral or, or is it animal? Well, soil carbon, I suppose, is, is an element. It's 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 um, it makes up a significant fraction of what we call the soil organic matter. So the soil organic matter is made up of plant tissue, animal remains, all the, all the microbial life that's in the soil, and it's in various stages of, of decomposition. So that's the bit that's really alive, and when you're a soil scientist, that's usually the bit you get a bit excited about because all these bugs and things are, 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 are controlling some of the biogeochemistry and the soil and the structure and all that kind of stuff. So soil organic matter, it's not the same as soil carbon, but it's closely related to it. The next one is, um, just, as, just because I'll, I'll, I'll have some data later and these terms will come up, um, soil carbon concentrations we often talk about. So this is the mass of carbon per mass of soil. So I've got 10 grams of soil here and I've got you know, 5% um, uh, soil carbon concentration, and I've got 0.5 grams of carbon in my hand. But what we, what, what politicians and, and kind of climate people get interested in is how much stock you've got. 
So what you're interested in is not the concentration per, per kilogram, but actually the total mass of carbon that's in the soil. Um, and often they, they will express this as mass or mass per unit area. So we talk about mass, mass per square metre of soil to a certain depth, often a metre. Our soils in the A, O, and B, not many of them are a metre deep. I don't know if your garden's the same as mine, but I've got about this much soil in, the back, in my back garden. So those are expressed as kilograms per metre squared or kilograms per cubic metre. Um, we need to know the density of the soil to do that. And actually, this is bizarrely one of the, one of the, the kind of stumbling blocks when we try to try to assess how much carbon is out in the environment, it's relatively easy to take a little sample of soil, take it back to my lab, and work out how much carbon is in that of soil. It's very laborious to go out and, out and measure the density of this soil. So I actually have to then go and bang rings into this, this soil profile, take a known volume back to the lab, dry it, weigh it. It's not hard to do, it just takes a lot of time. So stocks require us to know the density, and, and that's a, an interesting little problem that, that people are facing at the moment. And then the final one, uh, and uh, this is um, carbon dioxide equivalents. So when the government reports their emissions data, they use something called carbon dioxide equivalents. And, and this is because different greenhouse gas gases CO2, methane, um, nitrogen oxides, all have a different uh, effect on the atmosphere. And so to take their, take their different effects into account, they, they kind of have some equation which uh, equates them to the effect of CO2. So we express everything as a, as a carbon dioxide equivalent. And we'll, we'll come and touch on that a little bit later in the talk. And I just put this, this cartoon up just because I like it and just because I think it, it illustrates part of the carbon cycle, which we're going to come on to in, well, in, in the next slide, actually, um, which is, of course, these guys are, are eating grass. It's coming out the back end of the, the cow, going back and being cycled into the soil. It's helping the grass grow and, and uh, being cycled around. So let's just uh, move on and think a little bit about the carbon cycle. So I'm starting with a, a picture. So I took this a couple of a few weeks ago. I was I had a really lucky work trip to Montserrat in the Caribbean, which first uh, my first and only trip to the Caribbean, I have to say, but it was it was absolutely fascinating. Uh, and we were lucky enough to get a, 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 to go into the, the area which had been affected by uh, the, the volcanic eruption in 1996. So some of you will know <coughs> that Montserrat is a volcanic <coughs> island and this, this big vol volcano in Saint Pierre uh, blew up in 1996, and there were huge ash falls uh, all over the island. Pyroclastic flows. It's like a kind of a modern Pompeii when you visit it. And one that caught my eye was the one on the top of this, this building called White House. Um, and you see, you know, about 50 centimetres of ash. And in, you know, we can date it. it. It was 1996, and probably they can date it precisely and even tell me the day and the month that the, the ash fell. But what's really interesting is that you've got these trees which, is, which have... have are starting to grow. There's grasses, there's trees that are growing out of the ash on top of the building. And so we're starting to see soil carbon and the, the, the kind of the, the kickstart of the soil carbon cycle here, where these, these trees are photosynthesizing, they're trapping um, carbon from the atmosphere, their roots are permeating into this ash layer. Uh, they're dropping litter into the top of the, the ash layer, and this is being incorporated into a, a very young soil. Um, and so we, we're seeing this, this, this kind of soil, simple soil carbon cycle playing out in, in front of our eyes in this, this, this picture. And that's uh, why so I kind of really, really like it. I'd love to go back there and spend a bit more time and, and sample it. But, but, 
we can equate this to the to the kind of global carbon cycle. And so this is just uh, just shows you the, 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 the transfers between the different elements. I should have brought them later. Um, so we've got um, we've got the carbon store in, in the in the soil, and so that number there is the stock, and it's in a very large number in petagrams, which is some inordinately huge you know number with loads of, of zeros on the end of it, um, and. But you can see that the stock of, of, of soil carbon is enormous, and then we've got these two large stocks in, in, the, in the vegetation and the atmosphere. And then the, the numbers on the arrows are the flows between. So you can see the vegetation is flowing into the soil, and then the soil is, is, um, is respiring. So that's the living component, the, the microorganisms, they're, res they're respiring, and, uh, and, and carbon is going back up to the atmosphere. And you'll see those numbers actually on this diagram are not in balance. And, and that's a worry for us at the moment because if you believe these, these global estimates, then that balance suggests that we're losing soil from the carbon. And most of that is coming because we're creating new agricultural land around the world. So if we think at a global scale, we're going to zoom into our side in a bit, a bit later, but if we're at a global scale, we're thinking clearing rainforests for and clearing other grasslands for agriculture is is liberating lots of carbon and that's going up to the atmosphere. So let's think a bit more about that soil component. And I kind of like to think of it as a bank account. So you can imagine that if you you well most many of us have got a uh, a current account or some ready cash in our pockets, and then, well, when there used to be a bank somewhere, um, we used to be able to go to the savings bank and deposit some of that in the savings bank. And it's a bit, it's a bit the same with soil carbon. So we've got the vegetation, which is photosynthesizing, trapping, uh, trapping carbon from the atmosphere, and it is depositing that on the soil surface in the form of perhaps litter perhaps plant roots, um, and much of that is instantly used by all those, the, that biology that's sitting in the, in the soil waiting for food. Yeah, so the food, the food comes in, they gobble it up, they respire, uh, just as we do, uh, as that food comes in, and, and most of that carbon is only going to be resident in the soil, you know, between naught two years. So you know, probably some of you have got compost heaps. If you take a nice leafy piece of lettuce and throw it in the compost heap, it's gone. Yeah, really, really quickly. If you were to take some bark and throw that in the compost heap, it will be there for much, much longer. And so you've got these, this, 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 you know, bunch of carbon which has a very uh, small residence time in the soil. And then you've got the stuff which hangs around for much, much longer. And this is akin to the savings account. So this is a little bit that didn't get used up by the, by the biota. It's incorporated maybe into the soil matrix. So this is the mineral part of the soil. Uh, and it could be there for anything from 10 to 1,000 years. And we've, we've done dates in, uh, in the wire catchments. So They're not so far away from here, 800, 900 years of <coughs> soil, soil organic matter. So carbon-14 dating. Um, so, which is quite incredible, you know, we often think of oaks that have been stood there for hundreds of years and seen, you know, the passage of time, but uh, the, the organic matter in many of our soils has seen the passage of feet and, and, and such like for, you know, hundreds or perhaps thousands of, of years. So we have this store, and it's this bit that we want to try and influence, but what we know is that most of it is just going to go straight back up to the atmosphere. So it's, it's, this is one of the constraints that we face if we want to try and build soil carbon. So we'll bear that in mind. And just think a little bit where this soil carbon is. Um, so I'll start off small scale. So if we think of a soil, and there's a nice picture of me, uh, last summer stuck in a hole in a little field near Appleby. Uh, banging in my density rings, trying to trying to get make a carbon soil, soil carbon assessment. So we 
it was working with the Woodland Trust who were interested in uh, how deep ploughed soils compared with non deep ploughed soils. So they're trying to create wildflower meadows by turning the soil upside down. But, but the, the graph there kind of illustrates the, the, the changes in stock as you go down the profile. So most of the soil carbon for most soils is at the surface. It's not for all soils. There are some soils that behave differently, um, but most of them, most of the soil carbon there is, is at the surface. Um, you can see where we, we deep plowed it, it's, it's the other way up. Um, if we zoom out a bit uh, and look across the UK, then we start to get a kind of a feel. Um, it's interesting actually, I haven't noticed this until I've just. But the, this is the stock in the whole, you know, kind of a meat square, which is 17. And I've just looked at the scale here, and that puts us in this kind of zone, which is just about right actually, if we're looking at the, the kind of the, the east west divide, and there is an east west divide. So most of the, the, the biggest stocks of soil carbon are mostly in the west of England and in the north. Um, Anybody got any ideas why? Yeah. yeah. People power. Huh? People. There are no people in Scotland always. Mm, not so much the people, actually. Well, people the weather. Weather. Yeah. Weather's weather's the big the big difference. So on this side of the country, wet. Yeah. We know about that. This side of the country, dry. Um, Northern Scotland, wet and also cool. So it's those things which are, that, that, that combination of, of, of wetness and of cool temperatures promote the creation of highly organic soils. Because if you think you're a microbe living in the soil, what you don't, if, if the colder you get, the less active you become. Um, the wetter you get, then you actually struggle to breathe. Because you need to, if you're going to respire, you need, you need to, to get to some, some oxygen as well. Um, and so those two things really slow down the cycle. And so you, get, you tend to get much more organic carbon here. So, um, and the other thing is that, it is that in some places we have imperfect drainage, and so we get the, the formation of peat soils. So both organo mineral soils, but also peat soils. And I'll come on to those in just a minute. There are some patches in East Anglia, many of you will recognise the, the fens uh, there, so former wetlands, wetlands, is the clue again, wet places, um, which have, have lots, of, lots of organic matter, and lots of soil carbon. But you're right about agriculture as well, playing a, playing a role, something at the back mentioned that, um, because um, obviously southern and eastern parts of Britain have most of our arable agriculture, and, and they also have soils of low soil carbon because those soils are often bare for periods of the year. So we don't have that, 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 that kind of plant addition of litter and, and, and root mass of some of the year. And they're also often tilled. And when you till, you break up the soil and you provide access for those microorganisms to the, the carbon that's locked up in the, in the soil aggregates. I was going to show this one, but I will show this one. So this is this is a this is just a, a zoom in on Morgan Bay. It's a bit of a rubbish map, actually. I've decided <laughs> looking at it. I don't believe it. So um, yeah, I, I I was going to talk it. I mean, what what it, it shows, I think, is nicely is the division between the, the east and the west. But when you when you zoom in, I'm not sure the actual numbers really make a lot of sense. So nobody's actually gone out and measured these. They've kind of estimated it from, uh, from, from models and from isolated points that have been, been measured. But it doesn't really give us very much of a, a resolution, so we'll skip that. Um, so coming back to the, the UK, um, the UK carbon soil, ten, we have 10 billion tonnes of carbon in the soil. So each one of you has 15 uh, 15 tonnes of soil carbon for everyone sat in the room. Half of it is in peat. And so this is why 
the you know the protection of peat both in the uplands and in the lowlands is of vital importance. Um, it's it's not. I mean, we do want to sequester more, but we also need to protect what we've got. And this seems to be something that government seems to find quite difficult: is protecting something we already have. Um, they can incentivise you to do additional things to to um, to get some more, but but actually protecting that can, seems seems to be a problem for them. Um, so peat soils are, are really important, but also the soils of this part of the world, so the lakes and the Hagills and all those upland areas, uh, Ironside Knot, are all what we would call organo-mineral soils. So they have quite high organic uh, contents, but they're not peat soils, so they're not totally peat. We do have some peats, and we'll, we'll talk, to, talk about those uh, a little bit at the, at, at the end. Okay, so what's, what's then the potential? I've hopefully convinced you there's a lot of soil carbon uh, in, in the soils of the, the UK um, and around the world. And, and, but what is the potential of this soil carbon to contribute to net zero? We've got a little bit of maths coming up, but not much, hopefully. So if we think our UK carbon stock has said, did I say 10 million tonnes, I think? Um, that equates to a very large number of kilograms, 1 times 10 to the third, so 1, 10 with, one with, with 13 noughts on the end, yeah, it's a big number. Um, if we could increase this by 0.02% per year, so you know, what might seem like a tiny fraction, because we're talking about a big area and a big number, um, it equals to 2 times 10 to the 9, or 2 million tonnes of carbon per year. And that, coming back to this CO2 equivalent number, comes to 7.3 million tonnes of CO2. And you're going, yeah, well, okay, so what does that, what does that mean? Um, well, if we look at the UK carbon emissions, and I'll just wait my answer for that, um, we, we can see the emissions uh, associated with the different sectors there. So we have um, transport, energy supply, business, residential, waste, other. And then where soil fits in is under agriculture. So these are roughly 12% of our national emissions. And agricultural emissions then get broken down further. So um, and this is this is uh, 2020 data, I think. Am I right? Uh, 1990, 1990, 2020 on the left, 2022 is on the right. Um, so what you can see is, is these these total greenhouse the, the gas emissions from agriculture, and then there are three principal. Sources. So nitrous oxide emissions are also associated often with soils. Um, so particularly where you're using fertilizers on, so inorganic fertilizers onto wet soils, um, and you get nitrous oxide emissions. Methane emissions mostly associated with livestock rearing coming at the back end of the, the cow, uh, which is why people are interested in how you can uh, change both cow and people diets to reduce the reliance on, on, on animals. And then we have carbon dioxide emissions, uh, mostly associated with, with, with soils, but also with agricultural uh, machinery and the transport costs associated with agriculture and driving tractors and so on. So to put our number for the soil sequestration potential at zero, the 0.02% 0 .02 increase, you are a number that just about offsets those, those carbon dioxide emissions. So that's the kind of why people are interested in this and why that is, is a significant number. And actually the French do some good things, the French, and they, they lobby very hard in, in the climate, the, the recent climate talks to have that 0 0.02 enshrined within the international agreements. And in fact, it is in the Paris ran uh, documents associated with the UN Convention on Climate Change. 
So there is this target of 0.02 that people talk about, and it's often called two per mil, or two per, oh, my French accent's awful, but uh, that's what, what people will, will often talk about. Okay. Okay. So, I guess um, if we agree that we would like to sequester some more carbon in the soil, and there are other good reasons for doing this as well, having more organic matter is also good for the, the life in the soil, it's good for soil fertility, it's good for holding water, so it's got lots of additional benefits, so uh, it's, it's certainly something we would like to do. How do we go about it? And how could you go about it in your back garden or in your allotment or if you're a landowner on land that you, you own? So we're going to come back to the soil carbon cycle now. Um, and uh, I've got a, a slightly different soil carbon cycle, but it, it, it basically says the same thing. Um, so we've got the, the plants up here. Photosynthesis, coming back to photosynthesis, actually driving the whole thing, um, capturing CO2 from the atmosphere and adding that to the soil carbon pool. Some of that goes out through that, that blue line straight back up to the, the atmosphere through microbial respiration, so they're taking in oxygen from the atmosphere and, and putting back out carbon dioxide. And then we've also got these animal additions which are Coming, coming in from grazing animals, herbivores. Uh, and then the other thing we've got is this, this pool of soil organic matter. And if I was clever enough with my PowerPoint, this would be spinning round, um, demonstrating that this is a cycle. Uh, and so we've got material coming in, and we've got material coming back out as the, as the bugs break down the organic matter and respire uh, back up at the, 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 the gases back out to the, the atmosphere. And we've talked a little bit about what controls the speed of this. So we talked about temperature being important, we've talked about water being important, particularly if these get wet, uh, soils get wet, and we've talked about, um, we've talk also talked about temperature, water, uh, and we've talked about how when you break up soil it can accelerate the the, the cycle as well, so the speed of that cycle can change. And this soil, just, just out of interest, is, is up on the Trough of Boland, uh, and it's, it's, it's quite an interesting soil because it doesn't obey that, that kind of uh, graph I showed you to begin with. So it actually has some organic matter just along the base here, you can see it's quite a dark colour, and that organic matter has just been washed down, collected against an iron pan in, in that soil. So, an interesting soil from the organic matter point of view, still highly organic in the surface as, as well, uh, because it's cool and it's wet up there. So we've got the we've got the cycle, um, and and this is this is what we we're, we're going to be thinking about is how we how we can change both the amount of additions that we get to the soil, um, the amount of emissions that come from it and then the speed of the cycle. And I think this might be a good place actually just to break for our cup of tea. <laughs> do you think? Yeah. Is that the right time? Yeah. Or do you want me, to, I can go on a little bit longer? Give us a few more minutes. Two more minutes, let's go. <laughs> tips for, for sequestering more, more, um, more carbon in the soil. So the first one is to maintain a permanent uh, plant cover. And so this is some data taken from the Countryside Survey. It was, it's a survey that was conducted roughly every five years, for about 20 years until 2009, and now we, we haven't done it again since 2009. Nobody wants to fund it, it's quite an expensive thing to do. Um, but what they went out was to loads of different uh, vegetation types and measured the, the, the soil carbon amongst lots of other things uh, at those, those sites. 
Um, and if you look at this graph, I think there are two striking, well, perhaps three points that we need, we need to kind of pick up on. One, bogs, okay, peats, peat bogs store way more carbon than anything else. So this should be a priority for us to protect and, and maintain. Agricultural land, over the top there, stores the least. Okay, so this is for the reasons we talked earlier, it's often in, in the drier, it's often in warmer parts, and it's often disturbed with few returns from the, the, the agricultural crops that we grow. So we disrupted the, the, the carbon cycle and, and that's why that is low. These, which are your kind of permanent vegetation covers, there's actually very little to choose between them. So whether you have woodland or you have grassland or you have something in between, shrubs, not so much difference between them. The key thing is having a permanent vegetation cover which is undisturbed. And so that's the, that's the bit that really uh, makes, makes the difference. So there are some little differences between them, but nothing that's, that, that's, that, that really stands out like those, those other two. So that's the first thing that we want to try and do. The other thing that you want to do is if you have permanent cover, you don't want to disturb it. So if you go and so, so if you go and plow up a, a grassland, you will lose lots of lots of carbon. And so this graph is taken from uh, an experimental station called Rochester, which is down in the south of England, Hertfordshire, just north of London. Uh, Rothamsted was established in the, I think the 1850s or 60s by some very far-sighted people who established some experiments then. Um, and on one of the experiments, which was in grass, um, they plowed up the grass and converted it to arable. And on another one, which started in arable, they converted the arable to grass. And then they tracked the car soil carbon contents in both those soils. And what you see is that on the one which started in grass, uh, when it was disturbed, you, you, you have this big drop off in, in soil carbon, and then it starts to kind of even out with time and comes right down to the, the arable field. Where you started in arable, likewise, initially, you get quite a big you know, gain in, in soil carbon as you plant the grass, and then it begins to plateau out, and whether it will actually, it's reached the level now uh, that the, the grass one started in, um, but you can see where it's, where it's been in grass, it's continued to, um, to, uh, to, to, to build that, that soil carbon store in the soil. So you get this movement towards a new equilibrium. So if you've got, you know, a lawn in your, in your back garden, don't plow it up, because, or dig it up and then relay, relay it, because uh, you'll be releasing lots of soil carbon and you, it'll take you the best part of 50 years to get back to the soil carbon content that you had originally. The second thing you can do is use animal manures and composts. And this is again taken from the work of, of Rocky So, so this, this experiment goes right back to the beginning in, in 1840, so really long-term data sets. Um, and you can see some differences here between these sites. So these are, these are arable sites under wheat. Um, and the ones with the blue squares have had farmyard manure added annually since the beginning. Um, the, the blue triangles, farmyard manure annually since around 1885. And then the yellow and the red, the yellow is, is, is inorganic fertilizer, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Same amount as would be in the, in the farmyard manures, uh, added annually. And then the, the red circles are, is an unmanured plot. And so you'll see that when you add farmyard manure, again, you get that rapid rise in, in soil organic carbon to begin with, and then it begins to plateau off. Um, the, one that was 
was you know started 40 years after the first one, gradually approaching the the the, the one that's always had farming up in Europe, still hasn't quite caught up with it. The unmanured plot drifting down, so you're still growing the wheat every year, but the yields of the wheat will be lower and lower. Um, and then the MPK is you know maybe level or just drifting slightly up, and that's because it's you're still getting reasonable yields of, of, of wheat and returns of organic carbon through the roots. So adding manures or composts uh, is important, and it also has a lasting effect. So this is another, another Rockenstein experiment, started 1852, um, where they added farmyard manures uh, in, onto these, these soils, and some of them, they only added farmyard manures for 20 years, uh, and then stopped. But you can see, even when they last sampled around the year 2000, you still have more organic carbon in that soil than you do in soils which didn't receive any um, farmyard manures. And the one which is of receiving every year is continuing to grow its, its soil carbon. So having more carbon in the soil from organic and organic manures or compost is, is, is an effect that continues uh, for many years. And then this one is perhaps something that you know perhaps gets a bit you know nearer to our nearer to home here is, is thinking about how biodiversity restoration affects soils and supporting biodiversity in soils, especially including legumes seems to have a positive effect on soil carbon accumulation. And so this is data taken from Colt Park. It's an experiment you can actually walk past. So if you've ever been up to Ingleborough and you go on the far side of, of Ingleborough, there's the Colt, uh, Colt Park National Nature Reserve. And this experiment is, is within that National Nature Reserve. Uh, and it looks at meadow restoration. So it was a kind of a intensively grazed pasture very little biodiversity, and this was established, I think, in about 92, 93. Uh, and so they then looked at adding seed, reducing fertilizer additions, using manures, using fertilizers. And, and in this treatment, they have a couple, they're comparing uh, fertilizer, seed, fertilizer and seed, and then no fertilizer and no seed and looking at the carbon accumulation, both without trifolium potensi, which is basically a clover type, um, type uh, legume, and then with the, the same trifolium. And what you can see is that where you add the seed, you seem to be accumulating more carbon in these soils. And, you, and where you add the trifolium, the legume, you seem to be accumulating even more carbon. So this is a, an interesting thing, if you, you know, you want to practice in your back garden, you know, not adding lots of fertilizer, but uh, trying to encourage some biodiversity in your lawn, might actually um, accumulate some, some, some carbon uh, alongside the flowers that you might, you might generate as well. And that's a, a shot looking across, uh, I think that might be actually up at Heathway, actually a bit of biodiversity. I don't think it's actually yet. Um, <coughs> and then the final one is to, is to think about keeping organic soils wet. Um, and this is an example uh, from Holm Fen in Cambridgeshire. Um, so it's not one of our wet peat soils, it's uh, an East Anglian peat soil, a bit close to my original home. Um, and in 1850, uh, they were worried about the peat, peat, losing peat even at that time, probably because they were worried about agriculture and the loss of the soil. So some, somebody banged in a post into the, into the pen, and you might just about, in this reconstruction, I don't know, the reconstruction's a bit strange, but there's a kind of, a, there's, a, there's a top of a post that's been banged down into the, into the, into the, the fen there, into the organic soil. And, and it basically emerged from the soil over a number of years. Um, and 
you can see people having their picture taken by the, the whole Fen post, which became a, a bit of a tourist attraction. Um, and, but, but what it showed us is how, this, the, how much peat we've lost over that period of time in some of these, these lowland East Anglian peats. Um, and you can see in the graph on the right hand side, you've got the original peat thickness was around about 6.7 metres, uh, and gradually the ground surface has just, has just declined. Um, and that's largely to do with agricultural drainage. So, as, as you know, most of the, 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 the fens were reclaimed for agriculture from, from the sea, uh, and to make, them, make it possible to farm them, they were all drained. Uh, and that, that drainage has had an effect on the regional uh, water table depth. And so even in areas such as, as Holm Fen, which is a, is a nature reserve now, um, the, the, the depth of the water table has declined. That means that the, the peat has started to dry out. All those microorganisms which didn't want to live in the peat when it was submerged have all come in and are you know, gaily munching on the carbon and respiring it back to the atmosphere. And so all that, all that kind of six or so metres of peat has, has largely been lost back up into the atmosphere. Um, and so you know, keeping these soils wet and keeping the soils wet on uh, where we have organic soils in, in this part of the world is, is kind of a, a key thing to, to, to prevent uh, the loss of, of, of carbon back to the atmosphere. Part two. It's a shorter part. You might be glad to hear that, or you might not. Um, so, during the break, I'm going to ask to make a couple of clarifications. So, I'm going to say something about what peat is. So, we'll, we'll, we'll deal with that first. And then, something about what we do at the Lancaster Environment Centre. I think what I'll do is I'll leave that right to the end, and then I'll, I'll pick on, on, on that right to the finish. Um, so peat, peat is, is um, it's organic material, it's all come from, from plants, so it forms uh, where we have waterlogged conditions that are permanent or nearly permanent. And so the plant remains are laid down as the plants die or senesce or leave, drop their litter. And because it's very, very wet and the water table is close to the surface, um, those plant remains don't decay. And so very often what you, you then get is, is peat building and building and building. And we have some really lovely examples around here, both in the, the uplands, there's some areas of, of reasonably extensive peat in, in the Lake District and on top of the, the Howgills, uh, and then uh, just across the bay, and I've lost the name of the nature reserve where the ospreys live. Yeah. Yeah. You have you have a almost a lowland peak dome that's 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 formed there where you've got this growth of material. Um, so it's it and, and those plant remains are largely some of them are, are decay a little bit, but a lot of them you can you can really see still see the plant remains in the peat, and the ones that are deeper tend to be less easy to, to, to prise apart and see uh, what's in there. But certainly the woody stuff, you'll still be able to pull, pull out fairly understood, which is why you know people every so often pull out uh, uh, an animal remains or human remains from, from peat bogs and they're, they're, they're fairly well preserved. So that's peat soils, but let's think about our AOMB soils, and I promised you a top three of the, uh, the AOMB soils instead, in terms of their ability to store carbon. Uh, there's a nice little shot of one of our very shallow soils on the, on the knot. Um, but, but in first place in our competition, we have it's, it's something called the Dow Holland Association. I don't know why it's called the Dow Holland Association. Um, but, but these are the soils that are formed in the valleys, the floodplains, the tidal flats, marshes, and the raised beaches. So think about Arnside Moss. If you think about walking uh, uh, across to, to Silverdale, 
along the block beside the train tracks there, where Johnny's farm kind of floods, uh, Arnside Far Tower Farm uh, floods fairly regularly. Those are, those are the soils we're, we're talking about, Leighton Moss, um, other lowland areas. Um, they are variable, um, but they, they have in common this, this, well they tend to be waterlogged, and so they tend to do something which is what we call glaying. And glaying is when, when you have very grey and orange colours in, in the soil. Um, really see them in the, the, the little sample I've got here. So this was taken, uh, if, if you go on that walk I just described, out towards the, uh, across the, the base by the, by the railway tracks. So you get these very dark soils, which indicates that they're, they're, they've got a lot of carbon in, in them. It tends to be the darker the soil, the, the more carbon is in it. Um, and you'll also find pockets of peat in these, in these soils as well. So Wharton, the, the moss uh, where Leighton Moss is now, which uh, was cut for peat um, by the people of Wharton uh, back in the, in the uh, well, probably forever, but certainly the seven, I think there's documentary evidence from the 17th century of people cutting, cutting peat in that area. And I guess they did the same in the Live Valley as well. So um, there you'll find these, these highly organic soils. So those are the soils which have the the most carbon in them, and I guess what we would be encouraging, if we were thinking about carbon, what would be encouraging people, to, the, the farmers who have these soils, is, is perhaps not to drain them, but some of them would like to drain them because then the livestock can move, you know, so you get into conflicts, food production and, and the environment, uh, and who has priority. Um, so we might want to have a little discussion about that later. In second place, um, are these soils which are called the Malum Long Cell uh, Complex. So these are the soils typically of places like Arnside Knot, Eaves Wood, uh, Walton Crag, and that's where we have areas of, of limestone pavement and it's interspersed with small level areas and hollows containing soils which are a stone of silt loam or drift. So, Drift is the material that was left by the glaciers. So the glaciers you know, would have covered this area, they would have stripped the soil off these limestone pavements, but in some areas where they moved across, they would have deposited uh, mineral material. So Arnside Knot is, is a classic one. We've got these kind of terraces as we come down off the, the top of the knot, and on those level areas, uh, we will find deeper soils. And so perhaps and some of you in your, your back gardens, if you live in Arnside or Silverdale, you may have pockets of reasonably deep soil, and then you'll have some soils which are, which are very, very shallow. So these we would call acid brown earth. So this sometimes um, surprises people that you get acid soils over calcium carbonate deposits. But because we get so much rainfall, it washes the calcium out of the surface soil. So you, you, you may find, if you were to do pH, that your, your tops of your soils would be slightly acid, and then as you get lower, they may become slightly alkaline as you get closer to the, to the, um, to the, uh, the parent material. Um, there are also some shallow calcareous soils. So the one I showed you with my dog having a look at it, which was um, that one is almost a Renzina, but not quite. I think this is probably um, so. Renzinas are these shallow soils, and they form actually into the limestone. And you can probably just about pick out little lines of, of soil that are formed in pockets down through the through the limestone. So that's part of that that Malum Malum Long Sale complex. Obviously, named after Malum Town. And then in third place, um, we have something called the Marion Rock Complex. It's one of my favourite soil names. I don't know why. I like it. Um, and so these are these are soils which are, uh, uh, you know, if you go to the Sheila Slopes, if you walk around Unside Knot, you have the steep face there with the with the, the what look like screes. So. Um, limestone crags, screes, and, and you find a very thin soil. 
there. Um, and this is the principal reason that this, is, this isn't a big carbon store because it's only very, very thin, so it's got, not got the depth to store the, the big amounts of, of carbon. They're also quite you know, filled with rocks, so they're quite freely draining, um, so they stay aerated most of the time, they don't get wet and stay wet. Um, and they're also quite mobile, so these screens don't have lots of vegetation on them. Um, whether that is because they are moving or because they're grazed, I'm not entirely clear. Um, and uh, you know, you might argue that they, they could be stabilised and then maybe you might trap a bit more, more carbon. But at the moment, they don't have good vegetation cover on many of these soils. And because they don't have good vegetation cover, think about our soil carbon cycle. We're not photosynthesizing, we're not trapping carbon from the atmosphere, and so we're not adding anything. So maybe even these are a, an emitter, I don't know. Um, we've never done any work on these, this is all kind of my, uh, my exploration of the carbon cycle. Um, so it might, might be an interesting place to, to study actually and find out whether that, that, that really is the case. Um, so those are the, the, the kind of the, the three principal sets of soils that we have in the local area. Um, and you might want to think, I suppose, you know, in terms of how we might manage these soils and whether we need to manage them differently to, to how we're managing them at the moment. I mean, I think in, sort of, in terms of soil carbon, actually, we're doing pretty well in this area because we, we, we are lucky in where we live. We're not in an intensive food production area. Um, you know, if we look back 100 years, some of these soils would have been in arable production. So many of the farms that we are now livestock only would have been mixed farms. And so those soils would have been periodically ploughed. And if they were periodically ploughed, and we think about the Rothamsted data, they would have been losing quite a lot of carbon. So I, I would imagine that we're, we're up on the, you know, coming up to the top of those graphs at the moment in this, this area. Uh, and so the challenge is if, if you want to try and store some more carbon, they're quite, quite tricky.